The Matter with Carpenter, a story of the first year out of college by Henry Kitchell Webster, originally published in the Saturday Evening Post, March 26th, 1904. The steam pipes were still blistering hot and the little water hammers still pounded and reverberated inside them, just as they had done all winter. But the windows in the big drafting room were all open at least an inch or two, and the moist, warm, seductive breath of April was coming in. Sometimes it came softly like a kiss, sometimes boisterously like a burst of laughter, tugging the great sheets of tracing paper away from the thumbtacks, rolling hexagonal drawing pencils off the tables and breaking their points, proclaiming in a score of ways that it was time to quit work and to come out and play. She was not the country April, to be sure, the April of the early blossom and moist new-turned earth of the crowing cock and the lowing cattle, but like a fallen sister of hers, an April in grime and tatters, the April of a pounding, clanging, smoke-belching city. But her song was not the less seductive for that. One of the windows, to the huge discomfort of some who sat near it, was flung wide open, and before it, in his shirt sleeves, sat a youngster of twenty-two years. You would not have needed the somewhat intimate view of him that his soft linen shirt afforded to recognize him for an athlete, and the fine grain of his skin and the symmetry of his body told plainly enough that sport, and not labor, had developed it. And if something about his manner, even as he sat there gazing out of the window, had not been a sure enough guide, his clothes, particularly his necktie, which was riotously exuberant without being vulgar, would have classified him for you unmistakably as a college boy. The joyous, carefree expression of his necktie contrasted strongly with the look on the boy's face. He was frowning hard, but the frown was only half-hearted, superficial, a mask for the real expression in his face. He was staring out the open window, across a vacant, cinder-covered path, over the top of the locomotive roundhouse, over a smoky half-mile of factory roofs and chimneys, out to where everything ended in the smudge. And what he saw was a stretch of water, a boathouse, and a landing, with a little wave slapping and snapping at it, and a crowd of big, obedient chaps and one fiery, domineering little one, circumspectly putting the eight-oar practice shell into the water. If you could have stood between him and his picture and have looked him straight in the eyes, you could have seen beneath the frown. You could have discovered that the boy was homesick. And he knew it. Calling himself a fool and urging himself not to act like a freshman did no good. There it was, a big lump of lead pressing on the pit of his stomach, the conviction in his head that none of the gears fitted, that he was misunderstood, that he wanted to go home to his kindly mother on the hill. He had had the feeling before, but had contrived not to own up to it. But this morning, half an hour ago, a letter had come in from home, from one Walter Patterson, class of 1905. Patty stood today, though the fact was hard to realize, in the same big, important, awe-inspiring shoes that he himself had occupied when Patty was a freshman. Patty was his successor, and Patty's letter had done the trick. It was a long letter, in the effectively, affectedly bad hand of an upperclassman, a bit labored down to the signature, but after that, when he got the letter written and proceeded to relieve his mind in a series of postscripts, it was quite like hearing old Patty talk. Here they are. Perhaps you'll think this is all grouch, and that maybe things aren't going to pot after all. Well, you haven't seen the fresh. They've been getting younger every year lately, but this crop's the limit. They're just little kids talking about Papa and Mama and the geography lesson. Well, thank the Lord I'll be out before they get to running the college and have the whole place turned into a day nursery. And if you don't think we're going to get what for in the boat this June, well, I can prove that. Do you know who Cardi is trying at number five? Green, green, class of 1904. And that will show you what we've come to. And that ain't the worst. He's had to put me in your old leathers at stroke. 
When I think how you almost killed me last June in the last half mile, and how I saw your old back coming up at me like clockwork out of the mist, and that was all I could see, well, it just makes me sick. And have green splashing around like a boy in swimming behind. Lord. WP. P.S. I've asked Evelyn on for commencement in the prom. Cardi's going to let us stay up until half past ten, so I'll have time for the first three dances with her. I doubted if she'd come, now you're out. Baker asked her for the hop, and she told him she'd graduated, so in my letter I artless, artlessly contrived to tell her that you were coming on, of course. Perhaps you'd better write her to that effect yourself. After 10.30. Pat. P.S. Williamson is a lobster. I always thought so, and now I know it. He's been saying around that you wouldn't be on to coach the line in the fall. I told him not to make a fool of himself, but he seemed really to mean it and stuck to it. We almost had words over it. Pat. P.S. How many weeks can I have you for this summer? Let me know when you're coming. P. Every line of it had made him homesick, but after he had stared out of the window a while, his face lightened a little and turned back to his letter and read the postscript about Evelyn over again. Curiously enough, there was something about that that made him feel good. There'd never been any nonsense between him and Evelyn. They'd been pals, more or less, for three years, and it had been very delightful. So delightful that he had been aware sometimes of a vague, unacknowledged doubt whether they not, might not be something more than pals. Well, there could be no doubt about it now. He wasn't jealous of Patty in the least. How are those drawings coming, Carpenter? The superintendent was by no means a stealthy man, yet here he was at the table before the boy was aware of him. You'll have it all figured out before morning, will you? Oh, said young Carpenter, didn't you know? The chap has changed his mind about it, wants a lot of changes. Practically the whole job has to be figured over again. Sure, said the other. That's why I thought you'd better get busy. Hall leaves at noon tomorrow, and he's got to take it with him. I can't have it for him then, said Carpenter. I'm sorry, but it isn't possible. There was surprise in his tone, but no protest. Everybody within range of his voice looked up, and a snicker, imperfectly disguised in various ways, ran around the nearby tables. The superintendent stood looking at him, but said nothing. A little extra color came into young Carpenter's face. I'm sorry it happened that way, he said. I'd have been ready with the other. Then the superintendent unaccountably lost his temper. Schmidt, he snapped, turning on his heel. Mr. Carpenter doesn't find this job to his taste. Take it off his hands, will you? It was the mister that cut. Whatever else he deserved, he didn't deserve that. And for a minute... His temper hung only just below the boiling point, but he sat quite still. He had a curious feeling that if he shook himself at all, he might explode, and Schmidt took the work over. The noon whistle blew just then and relieved the tension. Carpenter's anger lasted only out of the drafting room and halfway down the stairs, but this was due less to his natural evenness of temper than to the fact that he had no room inside for another emotion. His sense of being lost, of moving in a world he couldn't understand and that couldn't understand him, occupied him fully. What was it all about? Here he was, working eight hours a day, six days a week. Here was spring coming with no promise for him of the long vacation, nothing but more long, hot weeks of six days each. And what was he doing? As well as he could make out, he was doing it because everybody else did. Arrived at his restaurant, he picked out the cleanest patch of unoccupied tablecloth he could see and sat down at it. He ate about half of the unpleasant soup which the waitress had plumped down before him from across the table. But at the next course of corned beef and soggy potatoes, his nerves revolted. He stared at the mess and pushed it away. Now, this was distinctly a new development. This restaurant was by no means the first nor the worst of its kind in his experience, and he had never, so far as he could remember, failed to meet halfway what was put before him. 
He'd been off his sleep for two weeks. Now he was getting off his feed. Matters were growing serious. Lord, how he hated it, how he wanted to quit, how he longed to go home, home to the hill, the campus, the boat, to Patty and the other chaps, and Evelyn? Yes, why not? She was part of it. But he wasn't going to quit. He wasn't a quitter. He wasn't the sort to walk off the field because the umpire had just dealt him a rotten decision. There were a lot of other chaps in the same boat, right in the office there with him flat-chested weaklings and eyeglasses, a good many of them. He would stick it out until the glad day when the superintendent should put an end to his misery and give him the sack. He was surely a good enough sport for that. There, that was one queer thing about it. They weren't. Schmidt, for instance, wasn't a sport at all. That wasn't why he stayed. But Schmidt somehow seemed to have caught on to the game, seemed to know what he was trying to do. Perhaps Schmidt liked it. While he ate his pie, and after he had finished it, long after, as a matter of fact, he sat ruminating. Patty's reference to Green offered him a clue. He remembered well Green's fall term, furthermore his own first view of him, of the big feet, the bow legs, the wide hips, the long back, the long sloping round shoulders, the incredibly long arms and he remembered how the joy over his first appearance in moleskins had given place to bewilderment and to sorrow when it was proved with more than fatal clearness that this Samson could never play football, that anybody, the merest weakling with a grain of football sense, could toy with him, could make him use his great strength against himself. And now Cardi was trying him in the boat, Cardi had a long, long head, and perhaps... He was rather startled on looking at his watch to find that it was half past one, and he paid his quarter and clattered down the two flights of stairs from the little restaurant in a hurry. But April was loitering about outside waiting for him, and she greeted him joyously. She laughed at him and daintily brushed his cheek, and his pace slackened to a stroll. He stuffed some tobacco into his pipe, lighted it in spite of April's playful attempt to blow out the match, and presently there appeared on his face a broad schoolboy grin. Perhaps he might not have to wait so long for the sack after all. Perhaps this very day he would be able to write to Patty in the words of Mr. Dooley's Kubian workman, Thank God I'm fired. No, he'd write it to Evelyn. She'd appreciate it. He hurried into the drafting room a few minutes later, hung his coat on the nail, and stood before the superintendent wearing a look of demure contrition. The superintendent did not look up. The expression was waste. Gradually, it settled deeper, became a look of real concern. It occurred with renewed force to young Carpenter that it was a far cry from this brusque, efficient superintendent to those scholarly old gentlemen to whom he had been wont to make his excuses and who had listened to them with such simplicity. The most masterly excuse, even a simple, obvious, true excuse, never seemed to weigh much with the superintendent. So when young Carpenter finally spoke, it was only to say, I'm sorry I'm so late. What do you want me to do this afternoon? I guess I haven't anything for you to do, Mr. Carpenter, said the superintendent. He stood where he was for a moment, not trying to see what the words meant, trying, on the contrary, not to see. Now that the thing had happened, it did not look as it had looked in prospect half an hour ago. This was a different world, this room. They had shut all the windows tight, and the water hammers clattered along the pipes in undisputed possession. Everybody was looking at him. And the Snickers appeared again, this time without disguise. Young Carpenter recalled a fragment of a conversation he had overheard between two of his fellow draftsmen a week or two before. Man don't get fired for breaking rules, said one. He gets fired because he's no good. That was the superintendent's verdict on him, and it was the verdict, no doubt, of every other man in the room. Patty wouldn't agree to it, he knew. He could imagine just what terms Patty would apply to the superintendent and to the men who snickered. But Patty 
might well be wrong. His standards didn't seem to apply in this world somehow. You couldn't measure distance by acre. He went back to where he had hung his coat, slipped into it, and walked out of the room. When he reached the door, the superintendent called to him, Mr. Hooper wants to see you, I believe. Young Carpenter didn't want to see Mr. Hooper. He was sure of that. He knew just what attitude the head of the firm, his father's old friend, who had known him from knickerbockers up, would take. He could spare this homily very well, and he was strongly inclined to go his way without, receive, without giving Mr. Hooper a chance to deliver it. But he thought better of it and knocked at the door to the private office. Mr. Hooper had him sit down, inquired somewhat waggishly as to his health and spirits, and then said abruptly, I'm thinking of putting you at a rather trying piece of work for a few weeks, what you boys would call, I suppose, a spurt. But if you don't care to try it, you must say so. With that for a preface, he explained. A certain inventive genius, Wagner by name, to whose star Mr. Hooper had many times and profitably hitched his wagon, had recently conceived a most brilliant idea. Backed by Mr. Hooper, he had already realized this idea in a model which demonstrated that the idea was good, but was still far from being commercially, or even mechanically, fit to put on the market. Mr. Hooper also explained, also explained the new machine in a general way and touched upon the large profit there was bound to be in making and in selling it. Then he stopped and looked hard at Mr. Carpenter. Now, here's the situation, he said. We learned not long ago that Sawyer and Company has a man at work on much the same idea, and that brings in a new element. There are still in our machines one capital defect and several minor ones, and we must get rid of them before we can market the machine. But we must market our machine before Sawyer and Company can market theirs. It's just as it would be, said Mr. Hooper, going rather far afield for an illustration, just as it would be in your football nine. The man who reaches the goal first wins the, the advantage. Yes, sir, said young Carpenter. We're doing all we can to help Mr. Wagner out. He's had already three different assistants, but he hasn't agreed with them. In fact, the situation has affected Mr. Wagner's temper and makes it rather hard to work with him. I had to talk with the superintendent this noon, and we agreed that if you cared to try it, you were the man. It will mean working days and nights, and if you care to try it, as you boys would say, for the good of the game, why, you'd better report to Wagner this afternoon. Here's his address. The man who bawled, come in, in answer to young Carpenter's knock, and the surroundings in which young Carpenter found him, justified all that Mr. Hooper had said of the difficulty of the job and explained the decline and fall of the three assistants. A room like a barn with big dirty windows, a red hot stove holding the temperature of the place at near 80 degrees, an incredible confusion everywhere, and at a drafting table under a window, window a meager, unshaven, grimy young man whose facial muscles twitched while he worked. Selvin home, he said, for answer to Carpenter's word of introduction. So Carpenter took off his coat and sat down at the other table, the table of the three assistants, and continued to look about him. The longer he looked, the worse it seemed. It was not all clean mechanical litter that filled the room. There was personal litter mixed up with it. Shoes, greasy frying pans, a broken wash bowl with dirty water in it, the remains of a hasty luncheon, and in the darkest corner, a tumbled bed. Lying around helter-skelter were tools, iron filings, and the disjecta membra of the model. Do you know about this thing? demanded Wagner, and then he began explaining it, not in the painstaking classroom manner Carpenter was used to, but in volleys, broadsides, dashing back and forth between the model and the drawing, his fingers pointing five ways at once. And young Carpenter listened for dear life, listened as he had done one night when, a humble scrub, they had taken him and pumped the varsity signals into him because he might have to play in the game tomorrow. He followed along pretty well, caught the general idea perfectly, and at the end, 
tried to express his admiration of the diabolical cleverness of the thing. But Wagner cut him short by plunging into a more practical consideration of it, showing how this was wrong, how that wouldn't do, how this improvement here made a change necessary there. And at last, coming down to one minor movement, he explained why it was wrong and how it was wrong and what must be done to set it right. Figure that out, will you? He concluded. And in an instant, he was lost, 20 fathoms deep, in some problem of his own, the capital defect that Mr. Hooper had spoken of, perhaps. Young Carpenter saw what was wanted, and he tackled it gaily. This sort of thing somehow was more in his line. There was an end to this job. When it was done, it would be done. Furthermore, it was a race. Another man was crunching up the track just behind them, and this thought lent wings to his pencil. So he figured the movement out, and when it was done, he called Mr. Wagner. Wagner glanced at his proud result and then stared at him. What do you call it? He demanded. Look at it. Look at it. Think of the weight of metal it would take to hold a club-footed, lopsided thing like that rigid. But, said Carpenter, you can't turn around the other way. There isn't room. Of course not. Well, then how am I going to do it? And then young Carpenter was told in seven different ways that he was a blank, unutterable fool, and all well within seven seconds. Is this an infant class, wailed Wagner? I don't know how you're going to do it. Nobody knows the answer isn't in the back of the book at all. You'll have to think with your head here. And he tapped his forehead and walked away. Well, that sort of tongue lashing didn't hurt. Carpenter knew what it meant. He had heard many a team captain toward the end of a hard season go it just that way. Train down a bit too fine was the comment he made to himself, and the seven ways of calling him a fool left no sting. But Webster's peroration stuck. There was no answer in the back of the book. What he was looking for was no longer something that the professor had coyly hidden to test his powers. Wagner didn't know. Nobody knew. The professor didn't know and would have had to put on his spectacles and search like the rest of them to find it. There's something in that notion, a perfectly new one to young Carpenter, that warmed him up inside. He set his jaws tight over a lead pencil, gripped the sides of the table, and looked at the thing, and so tasted, for the first time, the travail of creation. At noon, three days later, he was no nearer the end than when he had begun. The hours had flown, and the quest was getting more and more absorbing. He had been lost in it. Three times a day had found himself ravenously hungry, and somehow he had satisfied his hunger. He had not slept much. The thing wouldn't let him sleep. He was beginning to have nerves. His hands weren't quite steady, and once when Wagner dropped a pulley, he gave a gasp, and the sweat jumped out all over him. And Wagner begged his pardon. That ought to have surprised him, but it didn't. He had thought of a dozen ways, which were all obviously no good. He had not called on Wagner to look at one of them. He was going back over them now. He paused over the best one. Could it be made to do? Perhaps so. No, it couldn't. It was hopeless. Almost as bad as... And then from somewhere, the thing was given to him. Without any laborious thinking out, making up, the way was there, the beautiful, simple, only way that solved not only his problem, but another one besides. He drew a long breath. Thank the Lord, he said, here it is. Wagner looked and swore softly. That's it, he said. It was about two months after this, and late one night, that Wagner and the superintendent talked it all over. We've got Sawyer and company by the short hairs this trip, said the superintendent. You did a good job. Don't forget the kid, said Wagner. We did it between us. Ain't that the most amazing thing you ever heard of, the other said after a pause. And wasn't it just like the old gentleman to make a long shot like that? Why, well, that boy wasn't worth his ink. When I told that at last to old Mr. Hooper, he just narrowed up his eyes and kind of thoughtful, and he said, 
we'll give the boy another chance. We'll send him out to Wagner. If he'd said, we'll put him in a den of lions, I shouldn't have been more surprised. You're pretty fierce, you know, when you're on the warpath. I guess I did give it to him pretty stiff the first day. And there's another funny thing, the superintendent went on. If I'd prick him up just a little, he'd sulk half a day. He didn't sulk out here, said Wagner. He worked like a pup right up to the end. Well, he's having his fun now. I don't see why Hooper did that. Seems kind of a mistake, just as he was beginning to forget his college dude ideas, to send him back there for a week. We'll have the same trouble with him all over again when he comes back. Oh, don't you worry about the kid, said Wagner. And indeed, at that precise moment, young Carpenter might be said to be having his fun. He was lounging back in a recessed window seat against a stack of highly ornamental sofa pillows, looking at Evelyn, who shared the recess with him. She was sitting very straight and rather near the edge, watching the dancers go romping by. Romping, for the two-step, was one of those inspiring things that carry you around in spite of yourself. And besides, it was the last but three. Her foot was beating time to it. What luck, what mammoth luck this is, said young Carpenter. The remark irritated Evelyn, perhaps because he'd already made it several times during the evening, perhaps because the long silence which had preceded it made it sound a little perfunctory. Also, the two-step at that moment came abruptly to an end. It needn't have been a matter of luck at all, she said, if you'd only taken the trouble to write to me or to Patty. Besides, it's very unfeeling to Mr. Baker's grandmother. I don't mean it that way, but it sort of serves him right after making a clean sweep of your card like this. Why, here are five right in a bunch. What if he hadn't had to go home? Would you have given me any of them, or would you have left me all the evening to sit around and watch you from the corners? You don't deserve any. You couldn't have been too busy to write a word for two whole months. You'd forgotten there was such a person. And besides, I believe you're bored. He sat erect with a jerk. Well, it's true. I did forget. I forgot you and Patty and the crew and everything. I forgot to eat or sleep. I almost forgot to brush my teeth. But I was making something. This thing, he indicated a confusion of pencil lines on the back of his program, damning evidence of an insane attempt earlier in the evening to explain to her the mechanics of his great invention. This thing is part of me. It's mine. If I got struck by lightning this minute, I'd still have done something. And it was worth... The orchestra started up a waltz, and how they were playing it. Evelyn had been tapping her tight-pressed lips with her fan. Now, suddenly, her face brightened into a smile. An immensely tall young chap, but very boyish and inclined to blush, was standing before her, asking if he might have the dance. I'm awfully sorry, but it's taken, she said. Who is he? demanded young Carpenter. Mr. Greenwood. He's an awfully nice boy and quite the best dancer in college. He dances better than you do, I think, she went on judicially, and with an infinitesimal glance at him, she added, better even than Patty. Come, let's dance it, he said. The leader of the orchestra, who stood with his violin cuddled under his chin and looked not at his orchestra, but at the dancers, saw a young carpenter take her out of the crowd that was just around them to a part of the floor where there was more room. And as he had often done before with that particular couple, the leader followed them with his eyes and with his music. The waltz had become the accompaniment to their dancing. Evelyn drew a long contented sigh. I didn't mean it, she said. What? Did Mr. Greenwood dance better than you? How about Patty? he asked after a minute, and thereupon she laughed. I knew I could make you jealous, she said. Oh, yes, and I forgot to change it to that picture. <sighs> well, this has been The Matter with Carpenter, 
by Henry Kitchell Webster. It will be in a forthcoming collection of his short stories. To be notified when more short stories are available, you can join my Sunday recommendations list. Uh, you could also support me on Patreon starting at $5 a month or follow me for free. And check out dianedurantywriter.com for hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, music, poetry, and my other obsessions. Thank you.